Blog Talk Radio. The funeral is about to begin, sir. The calling hours. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk here. again to another great episode. Tonight's going to be a lot of fun. I get to talk to some filmmakers uh, that are a state below me. I get to talk to some people from Columbia, South Carolina, and Georgia. I'm going to have the one and only director Tommy Faircloth on this evening, along with actor Jason Vale and actress Debbie Roshan. And they are going to be discussing the upcoming film, Crenoline Head 2, which will start shooting in South Carolina here uh, in the spring months. Hopefully, uh, the dead man will be going down there to be on set and check out what it is all about. In a few moments, we are also going to be announcing the winners of the 2014 Horse Society Awards. I'd like to say uh, a lot of thanks should go out to uh, Big Mike D and Mitchell Wells over at Horror Society for tabulating the over 21,000 votes that uh, we received for the event. It's absolutely stunning the amount of work that they put in. And poor Mitch was in the middle of a move in the snow in Chicago, uh, you know, at the same time. So Mitch is finally back on the site as well after a few days of being in the darkness. We missed you, Mitch. It's good to have you back and have the site running on all cylinders. A little bit later on, uh, we're going to have our first DVD review of the evening, and that will be for Millennium Entertainment's Dracula, Prince of Darkness. And we are also, at the end of the show, going to be reviewing Screen Factory's Blu-ray release of Eve of Destruction. So we have plenty in the digital department to... uh, scope out and uh, a special shout out goes out to my good buddy Mitch out here in Raleigh who helped me play with a few programs today to bring some new uh, sizzle and pop to the radio show so over the next couple of weeks you're going to hear some new things added and some segments modified and things like that so I hope you guys will enjoy all the things that we're doing to make this a better show for you. Also, we wanted to remind everybody that uh, if you are not aware, don't forget that Horror Society Radio has another show on on Thursday nights. Chris McGibbon and crew from Creepshow Radio do their podcast usually at 10 p.m. Uh, Every once in a while they have an earlier start time. They cover a wide variety of topics. Uh, Just had Joe Augustine on to do a commentary on Night of the Demons. So definitely head on over and check them out on Horror Society Radio as well. So before we get going into our DVD review, oh, and also not to forget, we will also be featuring Mount Salem in our Metal Blade Records spotlight this evening. So we have plenty to cover this evening, but before we get to our first DVD review and before we get to our major interview for the evening, we are going to announce the 2014 Horse Society Awards. 
and uh, it, it was quite a turnout. We had over 21,000 votes. So what we're going to do is, I guess I'll run it in reverse order. I guess that's more fun. You don't want to give away everything. But um, first off, we uh, favorite television show, uh, the best of 2013, voted by the fans, was Dexter. We had favorite book or comic, and that was Superior Spider-Man by Dan Slott. We had, uh, for most anticipated films, our friends on from Concept Media, who were on last week, Midsummer Nightmares Part 2 won the award for the most anticipated film of the year, so very excited for them about that. Best use of effects was uh, Melissa Mira of Pin Up Dolls on Ice. Favorite death scene went to Randall Wilson in the Evil Dead remake. Favorite Scream King went to our friend Tyler Maine. Um, for those of you who don't remember, I did cover Tyler quite extensively when Compound Fracture was on its tour, and I'm glad to see that Tyler won screen, Favorite Scream King. And one of my favorite people that I've had on the show uh, a couple of times now won Favorite sc Scream Queen, and that is Miss Christy Faulkner. Christy, congratulations. I'm glad all the fans really enjoyed your work the past year, and I'm really looking forward to the things that you have coming up here in the near future. So once again, uh, congratulations to Christy Faulkner for, for winning Scream Queen of the Year. Best Director went to Manny Serrano, and Best in Web Series went to Florida in the Shadows, Best short film, once again, from our friends at Concept Media, was Ladies' Night. So Concept Media seemed to, to pretty much clean it up there. And for best feature film, The Conjuring. So once again, a lot of thanks goes out to all of the filmmakers, the actors, the crew, everyone that was involved with, anyone who submitted for the Horror Society Awards. Uh, your efforts were very much appreciated. You're all very talented people, and we're glad that we were able to view your work and help promote you. And again, a lot of thanks goes out to Mike D. and to Mitchell for going through the votes and tabulating everything. I, I know it was quite heated with Twitter and Facebook and all the votes coming in on email, but once again, you know, I think it's the least we can do for the filmmakers out there so that their voices are heard. And, you know, as Mike D and Mitch went the extra mile to make sure that all of this went off without a hitch and heavily promoted it. So congratulations on doing such a good job, guys. Um, and those are your 2014 Horse Society Award winners. And hopefully we'll be seeing some of these names uh, next year when we do the awards as well. But... Uh, we're going to we're going to do something a little different this evening. We have decided to jazz up our DVD reviews. So, without further ado, let's get into our first DVD review. <laughs> Tonight we are going to be reviewing Millennium Entertainment's Dracula, Prince of Darkness on Blu-ray. And, you know, another Hammer title. Definitely, definitely interesting to see this out here for the American audiences. Once again, Millennium has done a great job with this release. But to give you an idea, just the, the basic premise of the film... Four English tourists find themselves stranded in the mysterious village of Carlsbad, a sinister and remote place of deadly, dark legend. Their journey leads them to an abandoned castle where a nightmarish destiny awaits them. However, it wasn't just fate that brought them here, but an evil force in need of resurrection, a blood-craving beast known only as Count Dracula, Prince of Darkness. Released in 1966, 
This is Christopher Lee's second outing as Dracula, with Hammer pushing the cinematic boundaries of graphic gore and terror. And I have to admit, right off the bat, it, it, is, it is an amazing, amazing edition release. Very similar to when Frankenstein created Woman, they have packed this with all kinds of special features and extras, including um, a package of exclusive collectible cards, five cards, and again, I have not opened them. It's the kind of collectible that I certainly would not open unless I had frames available for it. So I, I really think it's kind of cool that they have included that kind of thing. I've hearkened it back to when Anchor Bay released the Collector's Edition 10s and included lobby cards for things like Suspiria and Lucio Fulci's The Beyond. But a little bit more about the film. This was a Terrence Fisher sequel to his own Horror of Dracula, which was released in 1958 and was released on a double bill with Plague of the Zombies, even though at the time, Hammer shot the film back-to-back -back with Rasputin the Mad Monk. But uh, what was kind of interesting about this is, is this is a film that definitely made much more use of the atmosphere and its locations. One of the things in particular that you, that you notice is just the incredible set pieces that Hammer Films had throughout its entire run of making films. The video transfer on this, um, it looks like it's its probably the same transfer that was used when Studio Canal released this film in the UK. Um, part of the reason I say that is the, lo you know, the Studio Canal logo basically comes across the screen when you start the film. It's definitely a, nu a much nicer looking version than the Studio Canal release, at least in my opinion. It's, it seems like the color's a little bit more there, and it's definitely a step up from the Anchor Bay DVD. Um, the audio on it is 2.0 um, Dolby. Um, it sounds fantastic. If you have a superior home theater system, I'm sure the film will sound even that much better. But even uh, with the speakers from the TV, it sounded just absolutely amazing. Now, to go along with the lobby cards, some of the other extras that were included on the disc include um, the Studio Canal commentary that had Christopher Lee, uh, Francis Matthews, Barbara Shelley, and Susan Farmer on it. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's been a couple years since I listened to it, I think it may be the same one that's on the Anchor Bay DVD, but I'd have to go back and check that. So it's really nice just to hear them converse about the film and about uh, Fisher's visualization of the film. Now, this one also came with a 30-minute making of documentary, Back to Black, which it just has a ton of people, uh, Jonathan Rigby, um, Mark Gaddis, David Huckvale, Marcus Hearns, uh, historians about Hammer's history. It's just it's it's absolutely breathtaking to to watch and just listen to the opinions of the people and what went into the film. One of the other really cool pieces is there's a four minute restoration comparison where they show where they went back in and touched the film up and how it looked on uh, when it was originally released. So I found that to be really, really cool and shows you how much work and effort really went into restoring the film. Um, also included is a 20, uh, another one of the World of Hammer episodes narrated by Oliver Reed. And it's, it's basically just details... Christopher Lee's amazing work with Hammer Horror Studios and all of the films that he's done and worked on with them. Um, it really just an amazing catalog of Lee's work. If, if you took nothing but his Hammer work, it's absolutely stunning when you look at everything that came came with this. And then you also have the still the, tw uh, the still gallery, and there are plenty of pictures from on the set, behind the scenes. It really seems to, to dictate how much fun they actually had while shooting the film. Um, you know, anyone that's a huge, you know, Christopher Lee, 
camera horror fan, Dracula, whatever you want to call it, this is definitely, you know, a, a treasure trove of stuff that, that we are not ever likely to see again. You know, as far as collectability goes, again, I have to rate this up there as one of the better releases. The inclusion of the lobby cards in particular is still, I feel, a, a nice touch. I wish it's something that more companies did. Um, I like the behind-the-scenes feature at the documentary of, like I said, anyone who's ever wondered or, or been curious about Hammer's history at all whatsoever in the industry, this is definitely something that you should look at. There's a lot that you can learn from it. So, definitely, this this is a must-buy. Um, as far as the rating on it, uh, I would definitely give the DVD, or the D DVD Blu-ray, the overall package about a nine. The movie itself is a classic. I would certainly rate that as as an eight as well. So, fans of Hammer, fans of Chris, fans of Christopher Lee, fans of vampires, this is definitely a movie that needs to go into your collection. So, I want to say thank you to. Heather Wixon out there for sending us this copy, and make sure to look on Horror Society here in the next couple of weeks, and we will have the written interview up for Millennium Entertainment's Dracula, Prince of Darkness, starring Christopher Lee, part of the Hammer Collector's Edition series. So make sure you run out and get that one as soon as you can. Coming up in a few minutes, we are going to have our interview with Columbia, South Carolina film director Tommy Faircloth and two of his lead actors, uh, Jason Vale and Debbie Rochon, to discuss the upcoming film, Credit Head 2, which will start filming in South Carolina here in the springtime. While they're on, we'll be asking all of them about some of their other work as well. I mean, we'll primarily be focusing on Criminal Line Head, but, you know, anyone that knows Tommy, Jason, or Debbie, you know, knows about their work in the industry. So there are, there are going to be several films and topics that we will discuss in conjunction with Criminal Line Head. We've already announced our Horse Society winners of 2014. I know that there's one young screen queen out there who is – Budding, a budding young Scream Queen who is very excited. I know, as I said, my good friend out there, Christy Faulkner, won Scream Queen of the Year. And our friends at Concept Media won several awards, including one for Best Short and then Ladies' Night. So I know they're all jazzed over there. And it was great to have them on last week. We look forward to having them on again soon, too. Let's not forget that a little bit later on in the evening, we're going to have our... Scream Factory Blu-ray DVD review of Eve of Destruction. But uh, coming up now, we are going to go ahead and move into our first Metal Blade Spotlight for the evening. Tonight's band is Mount Salem. The name of the CD is Endless, and the name of the song is Good Time.
Times by Mount Salem off of their most current album, Endless. They are in our Metal Blade spotlight this evening, and we will be hearing from them again shortly. Um, I have just been informed that Debbie will not be able to make it this evening, and that is fine. I will certainly have Tommy and um, Jason on to talk to us this evening about the film. And that will be coming up here in just a few short minutes. In about five minutes, that should be all starting. But I uh, wanted to touch on a few news bits first. One interesting and one that's kind of sad, but uh, I was uh, perusing some of the other horror sites out there, and I saw the first picture from a Human Centipede 3 final sequence. And if what I read in the article was any indication, this is going to be an absolute scream. From what I have been reading, it is said to take place in a prison with a 500-plus person centipede. <laughs> wow, I can only I can only imagine what this is going to be. <laughs> but the film is bringing back a. Uh, uh, Dieter Lasser and Lawrence R. Harvey, but they will be playing very different characters. Um, so, I like I said, I don't have too much more about this. This article came off bloody disgusting. Um, the only thing that was confirmed is uh, there's a 500 person centipede, and it is achieved without any serious effects work. <laughs> So we have that to look forward to here in the coming months. So I am I, I am waiting with bated breath to see how they manage to top the first two, or you know if they could even top the, the great South Park episode uh, where they spoof the human centipede. So that's kind of funny. And on a sad note, I did want to say to everyone, you know, it was very tragic to hear about the passing of Harold Ramis. Um, of course, we know him from a ton of movies, but most of us love him the most when he played Egon Spengler in the Ghostbuster series. Um, you know, just the sheer amount of films that he was involved with, Caddyshack, you know, Groundhog Day, things along, you know, all those movies along those lines, he will certainly be missed. Um, you know whether this does anything to whether or not there is a Ghostbusters three or a reimaging of Ghostbusters, we will have to wait and see. But it is it is certainly a a huge loss in the film industry, not just horror, but film in general. To to have the passing of such a, a talented man, and you know he passed away on February twenty fourth of this year at the age of sixty nine. So. Harold Ramis, you will certainly be missed, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in, in the further on. And, and, I, and I feel like I have to go and say that Bill Murray's tribute to Harold Ramis at the Oscars was was very nice and, and touching. I can only imagine what what they're feeling about the passing of one of their really good friends and fellow co-workers. So, once again, you know, Harold Ramis, you will be missed. And we are looking forward to seeing what happens with the Ghostbuster series now that you are no longer with us. But coming up in a minute, we are going to have a South Carolina filmmaker Tommy Faircloth on. And he's coming on with actor Jason Vale. Miss um, Roshan, Debbie Roshan, will not be able to join us this evening. Um, but we hope to have Debbie on another time. So, Debbie, get well, and we will hope to hear from you soon. Um, Tommy and Jason are going to be coming on to talk about the upcoming film, Crinoline Head 2, which will be shooting in South Carolina in the springtime here shortly. Um, lots of history to talk about as it pertains to the film, and it looks like both gentlemen are joining me now. Is this Tommy and Jason? Hi, this is Jason. Hi, Jason. Hey, this, this is Tommy. the good man. Hey, Tommy. How's it going, guys? Good, hey. man. How are you? It's good. It's good. Uh, you know, we have an hour. We're gonna we're gonna cover a lot about Crinoline Head Two. We're gonna talk about your guys' film careers. So, 
you know, this is this is a this is the podcast for horror. If you guys have something to say, you know, say what you want to say. Don't hold back. Don't feel the need to be censored. You can swear whatever you want to do. <laughs> Don't say that unless you mean it. I might have a couple kid, kids in the audience, so I have to be careful. Okay, well, if that's the case, then you don't, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. But, uh, well, first things first, you know, 1995, we, you know, Crinoline Head became a, a, you know, a cult classic film. Um, a lot of people don't realize when you look at it, you know, the film was made in the 90s, not the 80s. The film definitely is is almost like a warming throwback to the 80s style of horror film. Um, Tommy, kind of tell us originally how the idea for the film came about, and at the time, did you ever expect to be going into production on a sequel? Yeah, um, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't any five. Um, I was in film school, and uh, I was breaking for the summer, and uh, I decided, you know, I was going to go ahead and bite the bullet and shoot a feature. I hadn't done anything, you know, at the time. I hadn't shot a short film or, or nothing like that. And I was just, I was really against doing a short because I was like, what am I going to do with a short film? So I decided to go ahead and, you know, go for it. And um, <clears throat> what you may not know, it, it was shot mostly in 95. And then we actually had a premiere on Halloween. But then in 96, we shot additional footage um, that we added because the distributor wanted it longer. So, um, right. but actually, in in the film itself, it's supposed to take place in '96, because while we were shooting, I didn't think it would come out for a year, so that's kind of the way I planned it. But um, <clears throat> but yeah, um, I I worked on a lot of you know feature films. I uh, I worked as a production assistant. I worked in art departments, and um, I just worked on this huge budget movie. It was Die Hard with a Vengeance, and um, it was shot in Charleston. And once they wrapped, you know, I was just really gung ho I was like, you know, I'm ready to do something, you know, myself. And so, um I wrote the story probably, I don't know, in a week. Uh, I had the title, you know, since I was in high school because I, back when I used to mess around with video cameras and just do you know, stupid stuff with cameras and um my uh my sister <laughs> used to clog and I don't know if you know you know, a clogger, but um sure. she used to have this friendly skirt that she wore under her dress at these clogging events and um one time around the house, I was just like, you know, grab that skirt, put it on your head. You're going to be Kremlin head. You'll be the killer. And we just shot this, you know, dumb video. And I just, the t- I just kept the title. I kept the that skirt, and I thought it'd be something funny, you know, to do years later, whenever I decided, you know, I would actually do a film. But um, as far as the '80s go, yeah, it was kind of my um, it was kind of my homage to the the '80s films that I grew up watching. You know, it was shot in the '90s and. It took place, you know, it was in. It took place in the '90s, but you know, it had a lot of '80s, '80s look to it. The film look. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, we. You know, it, you know, initially watching, having seen the film, you know, you look back on it, and you know, I review a lot of the older horror films, and it was just like I, I could see like Slumber Party Massacre in there. I could see Friday mm-hmm. the Third. You know what I mean? I saw all of yeah. those elements, and I was like, ah. Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, I, I didn't want. I didn't Go want ahead. to be, I didn't want it to look like I was making fun of the '80s or trying to be '80s. Um, I just kind of wanted to be really, you know, real subtle. But um, I've, I've been watching a lot of like the Sleepaway Camp movies, and I love those. And so that had a lot of influence, like on my kill scenes. You know, they weren't really gory or bloody, but they were just kind of outrageous. And so I kind of mixed that in with the, you know, the really insane characters and the dialogue and kind of mixed that in with a little Friday the 13th, a little slasher, and, and that's where it all came about. So I was kind of making fun of the 80s, even though we weren't that far out of the 80s, you know, 95. Right. But, um, but yeah, that's where it started. Now, Jason, you know, what what drew you to coming to the sequel? You know, were you a, fa- were you a large fan of the original film and – you know, what is it that you see in, in this film in particular that, that made you come on board? Well, I'd, I'd worked with Tommy. Uh, actually, Tommy kind of uh, sort of found each other out in a strange way. He he put out a casting call, and I'm just one of those actors. You know, I've done a little bit of everything, and I always have a, a soft spot for doing horror films. And so I came across this posting, and uh, it was just a very bare-bones kind of, uh, production that that uh, that I knew he was kind of putting on, 
and I submitted uh, to it, and Tommy didn't respond to me immediately. He actually <laughs> did something that no other director has ever done in my career, my 23 years career. He actually sought out one of my previous directors, befriended him on Facebook, sort of picked his brain not only about me as an actor, but also about what he did for his film, uh, and I'm speaking of Gut, uh, and Elias is the director, producer, writer of Gut, and, uh, and sort of found out all this incredible information, uh, you know, exchanged sort of notes, and, and then hit me up on uh, my email or Facebook, I can't remember which one, and basically offered me the role out, outright, so that, you know, I'll, I will cast you in this based on Elias's word, and uh, what I've seen of, of your stuff on, on the internet. And uh, he said, you know, as long as you, you, were, you trust me and know that I'll, I'm going to do a good project. And, uh, and he showed me all his, his past stuff. And I, I immediately was like, yeah, this is, this is going to be a good thing. And I just sort of knew it in my gut. And, uh, and yeah, we went up into the mountains for three days, shot this film called The Cabin. And it, since then, it's, it's took in a slew of awards, I mean, more than I can, re- can even count, and has gotten into multiple festivals around the world. So <clears throat> I was very happy to have met Tommy. And so that sort of led into learning about his previous films, which were uh, Generation X and, and uh, Criminal and Head. And he told me that he always wanted to do a sequel, and not, not only just to Criminal and Head, but he also wants to do a sequel to The Cabin, one, or, or maybe expand The Cabin, uh, mm-hmm. But that's you know, we'll talk about that later. Uh, oh yeah, we'll, we'll, so, we'll get into more of that. Yeah. Yeah. So when he so so when he approached me, obviously you know about Krillin Head Two, he already knew which part he wanted me for, and sort of pitched me about it. And I said, of course, I'm, I'm absolutely going to do you know your next film. Uh, you know, be honored to. So, and that's kind of how it all came about. And then I got to watch it. I actually got to watch it, and that was a thrill. So. Now, Tommy, you know, he, you know, you would both, you both of you had said, you know, you had always wanted to do a sequel. I mean, did you know right after making it, and why twenty years later? Well, I, I really hadn't planned on it. I mean, I ended it, you know, the way I ended the film, pretty much the way I end any film that I've done, you know, anything could happen. There could be a sequel, you know, whatever. But um, you know, after I did Crimson Head, about a year and a half later, I did my next film and. It was just it was a little more serious than Kremlin Head and, you know, a little more dark, kind of like a, a Heathers or something like that. And so I just really, I saw myself kind of moving away just from the strict, you know, slasher genre. And I began working on my third script for a, kind of like a paranormal slasher type of film, but I never did it. And so because I, you know, I kind of took a break on the horror, the horror genre, <clears throat> Krillin Head 2 was the farthest thing from my mind. Um, he, so after I did Krillin Head Generation X, I, I finished the script for that third film I wanted to do. I just kind of stepped away. Um, you know, back back in the late 90s, you know, it was just so much more difficult than it is now trying to get, you know, your film's distribution, you know, just trying to get... There was no Facebook, you know, there was hardly an Internet. You know, there was just... sure. It was basically, you know, make a copy of your film, mail it to someone, and, you know, wait by your phone and hope you get, you get a phone call. Um, right. There were really no horror film festivals. Um, you know, there were, the, there were your basic non-genre festivals, which, much like today, they really don't show horror films. And so it just kind of, the whole process just really wore on me, and I was just kind of getting over it. Even though I got, you know, really good reviews for both of my films, um, and I got good exposure, I was just like, I don't know if I can tackle doing another film again. So right. I took a break from that. Um, I had, you know, kind of explored my other passion, which was, you know, roller coasters and theme parks. And for, you know, the next few years, I did do some documentaries and work on um, some shows related to that. But uh, early last year, I kind of, you know, started dusting off some of my scripts. And, you know, I was like, you know, I really miss, you know, horror. You know, it's, it's kind of in my blood. It's something I always want to do. And I decided, you know, I want to get back into it. And um, my friend Richard Abbott, who actually played Kremlin Head in the first film, said, oh, when are you going to do a sequel? You know, he's a dad now with kids, and he was just kind of joking about it. 
And I was like, oh, I'm never going to do a sequel to that movie. What are you talking about? But then, you know, I kind of started thinking about it. I was like, you know, it would be kind of fun, you know, to write and see where I could go with it. But I was like, I've been out of the game for so long, you know. Maybe I should think about, you know, doing a short film, you know, maybe try to get it in some festivals, get some more, you know, get some attention and kind of get my name back out there before I try to tackle a feature again. And so that's what The Cabin was. Um, So last, you know, early last year, I decided, you know, I'm going to do a short and just, you know, try a lot of this new technology, you know, a lot of the new camera stuff and, you know, what's available and just see what I can do, how to look, you know, see what kind of product I can get with no crew, no money, (laughs) and a weekend shoot. And so me and my producer, Jason, and Morgan, which was the other girl in the film, us four, we just kind of headed off, shot this film over the weekend, and a week later it was done. And it just kind of took on a life of its own. It came out really well. I was really happy with it. Um, you know, it got, you know, in a lot of festivals. It won some awards, and it was and, really shocking. It was shocking to me. And so and, and I, 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 like to, I like to butt in on that because Tommy's being very modest. He, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, it, it was it was the fastest made film from – from the minute he cast it to when we shot it, I mean, you know, we shot this thing in three days. Within a week, he had it edited. Within, I think, two weeks, we had it in a, our first film festival. Within oh, like wow. the first month or two, we we had started winning awards. I mean, it was it was like lightning fast. Like I've done films that took six years to get done. You know, I mean, I, I watched myself age on film <laughs> with other <laughs> actors, uh, and and this was just mind blowing. Like I'd never seen somebody work so hard and so fast and just had so much insight to what he was doing. Like he, he knew, you know, no storyboarding, no nothing, you know, and I, and a lot of directors do this, but I've never seen one with such crystal clear, uh, just knowing what he wanted take after take shot after shot. I mean, no time was wasted. We just went from one to the next, to the next, to the next, and it made it so easy as me for me as an actor to to work with someone that knew what they wanted and and it it just it just all made sense it flowed and i think the result shows you know that Tommy has a vision and he knows how to create it so well, let me ask you this Sorry. i mean go, going hand in hand with that jason you know you're definitely not a stranger to both lower budget and higher budgeted films i mean you know of course you did you know the Abraham Lincoln versus the Vampire. Uh, you know you the zombies. The, or zombies. <laughs> I'm sorry. One. I'm, I'm the, looking, the at, I'm looking at two different things. Yeah. We did the better. Abraham one. <laughs> Lincoln versus the zombies in 2012. Um, you know, but you've also been. You know, you did Sleepy Hollow. You've been on Sleepy Hollow. Um, you know, stuff like that. Last week. What's you know? that? I was just on the originals actually this past week uh, for the first time, which is nice. So the WB Vampire Diaries spinoff. Right. Um, well, you know, with you know having worked on film, I've never done anything that was big budget in Hollywood. But you know, there's so much that goes in with contracts and unions and things like that. You know, how do you how do you prepare for the experience where you don't have all of that around you, where it was something just as simple as you, Tommy, the producer, and another actress? I, I think I might be a little backwards for most actors because. I sort of cut my teeth on independent film up in New York. I lived in New York for 12 years, and uh, and you know, I, I like I don't really like to talk about this, but the fact of the matter <laughs> is, when I first got to New York in like 1999, 2000, I had landed a couple pretty decent agents uh, in New York. You know, one, one was one of the biggest in the country, and you know, they sent me out to audition after audition, but after a year. I wasn't booking anything. I, I was just too green. I was too overwhelmed by New York and a million other circumstances. And I ended up losing both of my agents within the same week. And I literally would say to myself, I cannot pay someone to cast me in a project right now. That's really how I felt at the time. Uh, I was at such a low in my career. Uh, and I had done very, very little film at that point. A couple of things that I had started in the Southeast and then, you know, maybe a student film or two. Uh, but, you know, I pulled myself up, up on my bootstraps, and I and I got to work, and I started just doing any independent film I could get into on my own, uh, which taught me how to be my best agent, my my own best manager, 
and my own PR guy. And uh, and over the period of time in New York, I amassed about 40 different independent films of all shapes and sizes. Um, and one of those, back in 2005, was my first horror film that I'd actually ever done. It was called Best Ribs in Town. Uh, and you'll never find it. <laughs> it's one of those you know horror films that ends up on a shelf that the director doesn't want to show it to anybody. You know, and it was brilliant in its own own way. It just unfortunately, you know, that's what happens sometimes. And uh but because of that one film I sort of fell in love with the horror genre, you know, not knowing anything about what being in a horror film is like, uh, other than watching them from time to time. And uh and I just I loved it. I loved, you know, running around, screaming your head off with covered in blood at three in the morning, you know, <laughs> like yeah. a bunch of lunatics. But, you know, we're the rock stars of the film world. We're the ones that do stuff that no one else would dare to do. And along with, with that, you know, most horror films don't have budgets. So you really learn to make the most with the very least, you know, the least amount of time, the least amount of money. Uh, and you just, you stretch it. I mean, you stretch it like you, you can't even imagine on some of these film shoots you know, doing 20 scenes in one day, kind of stretching. And, oh, yeah. uh, but you get it done. And, and just sometimes out of those, you know, out of all the films that you do, once the blue moon, one or two of those actually sort of elevate to a different level that you, you never saw coming. So, uh, and, the, and the cabin for me was one of those films. It just, it was just a little tiny short and, you know, most short, that I've ever done usually don't go very far, you know, out in the atmosphere. You know, they just sort of fizzle away, but this one has had a lot of staying power. And uh, so, you know, to be in the cabin was, for me, a huge accomplishment. You know, when it was a short film, uh, it just sort of taught me that you, you should never pass on the little guys because sometimes the little guys have a lot to offer. So I, I oh, always I, keep... I agree. Yeah, I always keep I agree my options 100%. open. Yeah, you, you never know, know. You never know when that, that one job Think about all might. those years ago. You know, he, he jokes about it from time to time, but look at Bruce Campbell. When they did Evil mm-hmm. Dead, they had no concept that that movie was going to become what it did. And, you know, looking back on it now, that movie made Bruce Campbell's career. It did, yep. Totally. You know, you, you just you can never discount any anything that you work on at all. Yeah. Now, Tommy, hear, hearing everything that Jason just said, you know, being in the industry, working on larger films, how much of a different, how much of a fresh breath is that for you? You know, having an actor of Jason's caliber on there and not worrying about him being, for lack of a better term, you know, a spoiled diva. How is it to have an actor that is prepared to work? Oh, oh I'm a in diva. Bare don't, bones don't, don't. environment. Yeah, don't let him. Don't let him fool you. He's a total. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, well, you know, I avoid that like the plague and. Um, with all my films, I kind of have this thing where I just kind of I kind of meet the people, talk to the people that are interested in auditioning, just to kind of see how I vibe with them. Kind of see are these people just going to be you know a nightmare to work with, or they like, or they want to work on the film because they enjoy the work. Right. Um, you know, everybody wants to make money, everybody wants exposure, and everybody you know wants to have a good time. But if 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 you're coming into the project, you know, if I sense, you know, this person is, you know, more concerned with what they're going to get as a daily rate than, you know, working on the project, I just kind of avoid them. And see, Jason was the complete opposite. I, And that's one reason why I kind of reached out to Elias. I was, because I was like, you know, Jason submitted for this. Actually, Jason, I don't know if I told Jason, his agent actually submitted him first for this. And I kind of had him in my pile to call back. And I just hadn't had callbacks yet, but then Jason reached out to me personally, and that was kind of a check for me. Because I'm like, okay, here's someone eager, you know, they're not waiting on their agent, so they're not sending them on jobs. And so that was, you know, one of those things, honestly, he likes to work. And then, you know, when I finally did talk to Jason, I'm like, you know, you really, I'm, I can see you've done a lot, you've done a lot of features. Like, I just want to make sure you're clear, you know, this is just a short film. I don't know what's going to happen with it. I don't know where it's going to go, what's going to happen, but I know what I have planned and what I want to happen. And he was all about it, and so I was like, perfect. And then he actually came down um, to read with all the other people that I was casting, or auditioning rather, to play, you know, the girl in the film, which I thought was another. I mean, well, who, what actor is going to, you know, drive three hours 
you know, out of their way to just read with other people. Three and a half. You know, may or may not, you know? Okay, whatever. Sure. As long as I bought him Starbucks, he was happy. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, so that's that's kind of where I am with any project. Even going into this new project now, I've got some roles already cast, but, you know, a lot of these people, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, they'll send me their photos, i kind of narrow them down, look at their reels, and then the audition process starts with emails, just seeing how they respond. And I've had so many people <laughs> that have, you know, been so, you know, I give them an audition time and they're already, already, I haven't even met them, you know, going, oh, well, I can't do this time. How about this time? Or what about, you know, and it just, this, I can just sense it. And I'm just like, never mind. I'll put you on standby. And you haven't listening and you've got that email from me, just take, you won't hear from me. But that's, you know, it's just kind of like, you just, I can just sense if someone's going to be a nightmare to work with or not. And so, you know, I, I want actors that are good, of course, but I want actors sure. that want to work for the work. Because that's what I'm doing. I'm not making money, you know. I don't make a living doing this. I do it because I love it. And so right. I want my, my film sets to be fun. I want everybody to have a good time. I want really professional, good actors, but... You know, I don't want someone there make, making it a nightmare for everybody. And, and I, I actually get a little more claustrophobic on large sets because they're so ginormous. They're so uh, overcumbersome of, of of just everything about it is just too grand for me. Like you get you get a trailer you get stuck in for who knows how long. You're, you're sort of locked in your own little world. Yeah, it's so much money PA. too. I just I just see it as money. I'm just sitting here going, you know, why are you spending money on this and what I could do with this and what I, you know, it's just. Yeah. You know, like I, it's I'd rather just, be on. I'd rather be on set next to the director the whole time, you know, watching it all go down, you know, watching people work, watching people have holding fun. a boom pole. And yeah, <laughs> and light. lifting a couple things here and there. Yeah, Jason wasn't just an actor. Like in between, you know, he would hold light reflectors for me. He would do it all. I mean, he had to do oh, sure. four of us when we shot. And did massages. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, I, I understand that perspective. I mean, you know, I do effects work for the most part, but, you know, it, there is there is the thrill of being on set because you never know when you can help out, you know. I've held a boom mic. Um, I've held lights. You know, I've acted, and I'm by no means a great actor. I play a better corpse than anything else. But, you know, I, I dig that. I under, I understand that passion of just wanting to be there and help, you know. uh mm. It's it's you know it's just like for me it was always a dream to do stuff like that and and it sounds like those are the types of people that you are and that you guys like working with. Now one of your yep. co-stars who was supposed to join us this evening, Debbie uh, Rashan, could not make it. Th- but I wanted to ask you, um, what led to you casting her and her role, and you know how does it feel having you know because in my opinion when you talk about scream queens and women that have made an impact in the genre i certainly feel that, like debbie is one of those people so what you know uh, yeah. what brought what brought her onto the project and you know how much buzz has her name generated alongside of jason's for the film yeah uh, well before we get started I, I did talk to debbie before we started and just so everybody knows she's not being a diva or anything she uh, oh no no she, no she's no, heard not her saying back. that at all she heard her back she heard her back um, a few days ago, and the doctor has her on some heavy uh, muscle relaxers, so she didn't want to kind of sound like she's stoned talking to us. So she <laughs> just kind of, she's like, I'll make it up to you. I'm like, don't worry, just get better, you know. But um, we love yeah, you, Debbie. Well, we, we will <laughs> gladly have we will gladly have Debbie on another day, or if she would like to take part in a written interview, I would love to have her. But oh, yeah, yeah she, certainly she, tell us about how about she became. It. Tell us how she became involved and, 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 you know, like I said, tell us about the the hype that her and Jason's name have have brought to the project. Sure. Well, you know, I mean, when I was working on this, you know, because I wanted to use Jason and I want to use Morgan, who was in the cabin again, in my next film, I I was like, you know, when I'm going into Kremlin Head 2, I want to use you guys in it too, but, you know, most of the cast is in college. So there were only certain parts I could cast. I knew I could cast Jason, um, which he actually, we'll talk about later what he's playing. But um, there was another character of this, it was just this hilarious character, it's one of my favorites actually in the film, of this groundskeeper. You know, it's a, and the whole time I wrote it, I was just thinking of her while I was writing it. Um, she's kind of this foul mouth, you know, rednecky chick, lives in a trailer, 
kind of uh, used to be the hot thing back in the day, and now she's just in a bad situation. She'll say anything. Anyway, it's, and I was just thinking of her the whole time I was writing it, and so I reached out to her to let her know about it, and I was like, I don't know if this is something you might want to do because, you know, she's usually the vixen, you know. Sure. The sex object. And I said, this is something completely different, and then she read it and was like, no, this is totally something I want to do. She said she was all about it. But um, I had worked on a film with her way back in the day. Um, a friend of mine did. It was called Hit Cheerleader, Dead Cheerleader. And I did some camera work on that, and that was when I first had met her. And she actually worked on another uh, film called Hell Block 13, uh, a friend of mine did too. So, I, I mean, I would worked with her before, and I knew her, and, she, you know, she's super sweet and everything. So I just knew I just wanted to get a name for that role because it was going to be something that brought a lot of comic relief to the film kind of held it together, but I knew she would do it justice because it was just, I was just totally, I was thinking of her the whole time I was writing it. <clears throat> and so once, once she agreed to it and, you know, of course, you know, all of her fans, you know, she kind of announced it and let them know. And we've got a ton of buzz from it. I mean, a lot of podcasts we've been on and people are like, how did you get that Rosh Sean in your film? I'm just like, are you kidding? Please. <laughs> no. <laughs> she's an old friend. She'll do it. But no, I was really nervous, you know, because I was like, I hope she doesn't think, you know, because it's kind of one of these roles where you're not going to be like the most gorgeous, beautiful person on screen. You're just going to be this crazy bitch that says all this stuff. And she's like, oh my god, I love it. <laughs> so I think, I, mean, I think she's going to do great. And there's some, there's some good, you know, character building, you know, for her in it. But some of the stuff she says just cracks me up. Just reading, it. I can't wait to see her say it. Now, Jason, for you, um, you know, being a horror movie fan and, and loving the genre like you do, you know, how does it feel to be co-starring next to, like I said, someone that that is very influential in in you know the Scream Queen community? You know, what, yeah. what do you you know? How much are you looking forward to the role? And you know, some of her performances, depending on what you watch, you know, like I'm a big trauma fan, so. Like, two of my favorite films with her, of course, are, like, Terror Firmer and Tromeo and Juliet. But, you know, depending on what you watch her in, you know, she she can be a very explosive actress in, in her performance. So how do you, you know, or how are you looking to, to play against that, and how do you prepare for working with someone like Debbie? Well, I'm, I'm wondering, well, uh, from what I've seen of the script and, and Tommy's, I'm always I've only seen half it so far, so I, I can't I can't give away too much or say too much. But sure, uh, I'm I'm still waiting to see how he's going to squeeze us together. Uh, and I know it's it's going to be in there, but I have yet to see that part of the script yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's exciting in that sense. That I have no idea what our scenes are going to be like between each other, which could be very interesting. Uh, no, it's always it's always a thrill to work with uh, someone with the body of work that she has. I mean, it's it's you get her IMDb and it's it's like reading a phone book. It just goes on and on and on and on. Um, I worked with uh, actress like Bill O'Burris Jr., you may know, um, on Abraham Lincoln vs. Zombies. And he's another one of those just incredibly gifted people that, uh, you know, when, you, when you're in the presence of an actor that has so much concentration and focus and ability that you, you, you feel small in comparison next to them on screen and you and, and and uh, and Bill is like the most humble guy. I'm sure Debbie is too. I have, I have yet to, you know, I haven't met Debbie. And I, don't, I don't really know her in person, but but I find it's a, a trait with most actors that work a lot that they're very humble and and they um, their work just carries on infinitely to the universe and people respect it and acknowledge it and you just it's a thrill. I mean, any time I work with an actor that. I know is better than me or has, you know, at least a resume that wraps around me 18 times. Uh, I know it's going to be a great challenge because it'll make me a better actor and make me sort of lift me up to a different level as well. And not just in the acting, but in, in the community as well, the film community. And I've worked with, you know, a couple of scream queens in the past, but uh, she's by far. Yeah, you Jason's know, work. He hasn't biggest. said it. Jason's work with Susan Sarandon. Tell him about that, Jason. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, that's like I said, considered a scream queen of sorts. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, she was in Rocky Horror. Of course, she's. Yeah, she's. I worked there recently on Tammy, the uh, Melissa McCarthy feature film that we shot up in North Carolina, and uh, and, she, and she's just a wonderful person. Again, same qualities, very down to earth, 
you know, she's she's just another person, another actor, just like you or me. And and when you work with that kind of energy on set, you just feel very grounded and very, uh, you know, safe. It's contagious to work in that kind of environment. Everyone wants to to make the machine go. So I mean, I I definitely understand that aspect of it. Yeah. Now, one of the things that you guys had mentioned in particular um, was you had mentioned social media. You know, uh, when Crinoline Head two or when Crinoline Head first came out, of course, the inter- internet was in its barest of infancies. You know, nowadays mm-hmm. we have Twitter, we have LinkedIn, we we have all mm-hmm. of these facets for social media. You know, how much more do you do you feel that that helps to generate interest for fans in your projects? And do you feel like there's any drawback that some of the air of mystery is taken out of things because as soon as something happens, it's on social media? Well, you know, I think it's 100% awesome. I, I don't see any any bad aspects as far as me, as far as other independent filmmakers like myself, because, you know, back in the day when I was doing my two films, you know, DVDs were just coming out. I mean, it's seem like it hasn't been that long, but it has. Right. So, you know, everybody can say they're doing a film. You would never see it. You know, if it wasn't in Fangora magazine, you never saw it. I mean, luckily, I got in it on my first film, and that flipped me out, and that's kind of what helped Kremlin Head. But, you know, there were a ton of other movies out there that, you know, you've never heard of. There was no, there was no way to see them online. There was no way to see them at festivals because there was no such thing as a horror film festival like them. So if you didn't see it in, you know, Film Thread or Alternative Cinema, you know, the horror magazines, if it weren't in that, it didn't exist, basically. So with, you know, social media, I mean, all you have to do is search horror films or, you know, whatever, and you just you just start networking and meeting everybody that works in the I mean, I've, over the past year, I've met more people and, and been to more festivals and seen more horror films than I have, you know, the whole time I've been doing horror movies and learned about movies I didn't even know about. So, I mean, if it weren't for, you know, my Facebook and my my Facebook pages for my films, you know, Crew One Head Two probably wouldn't have ever gotten, you know, made unless, you know, I completely saved up my money for twenty years and self funded it like I did my other two films, you know. And and then once right. it was made, you know, no one would know about it. Now everybody knows about it before it's even made, which is crazy because back in the day it was the opposite. You would do a film and then spend, you know, two years trying to promote it to get someone to go see it or hear about it, you know. Yeah. Now, Jason, for you, you know, kind of along that same vein, because you had mentioned, you know, the thing with, you know, having having a promoter and everything, do you feel like social media and Facebook has eliminated the need for really having an agent, or do you feel like you still need an agent in this day to go along with your social media? Yeah, I mean, they all go hand in hand, but, I mean, the, the beauty of social media is, you do have control. You do have power. And I sort of, I sort of took a note from Bill O'Burris Jr. Not to keep bringing Bill up, but um, he doesn't mind. Trust me. Uh, <laughs> he, he sort of taught me how to get onto these uh, PR blogs and and sort of use the machine to promote and to get on to Facebook and Twitter and all the other social media websites and just churn that thing out. And 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 I'll, I'll mention it later, but I had a director recently find me, again, uh, sort of as Tommy did, but fi- find me straight through so- social media, um, through through Twittering and things like that, and just sort of kept seeing my name pop up in the universe, and by crazy coincidence, when, he, when they were looking to cast a lead in their film, he turned to the producer and said, I think I found a guy for our film, and he mentioned my name, and that producer said, wow, I just saw his film at a festival. And I love him. What film was that, Jason? What film was uh, that? It's the rec- Rectory is the film that I'm... I'm sp- oh, ca- The Cabin. Sorry, Tommy. Thank you. I'm, I'm just <laughs> <afraid>. <laughs> well, we'll talk about the other film. I'll do a little <laughs> shout out to it in the end. Oh, yeah. Well, um, we're going we're gonna to talk about your but other But that's just too, another you know? example. But that that's shows you the power of, you know, of what what the Internet can do in this day and age. It's it's really an amazing tool. And, and you know, I am my own best PR person. and I don't really need to hire someone... You know, it takes a little extra time out of your day, but what you get back is tenfold. Sure. Now, hand in hand with that, you guys just recently did your. Um, I want to say it was Indiegogo. I keep I confuse Indiegogo mm-hmm. and Kickstarter Correct. all the time. 
But um, you guys had your Indiegogo campaign, and it seemed like that went fairly successful. Kind of talk about, yeah. um, you, you know, Tommy in particular. You know, you said when you did your first film, that was pretty much, you know, out of your own pocket. How much of an advantage would you guys say things like Indiegogo give independent filmmakers today? And what are your guys' stances on bigger name studios and directors using Indiegogo <laughs> to fund projects? Mm-hmm. Okay, well. I mean, it's a great tool, and I I'm all I love it. You know, I mean, it wasn't around back when I started out, um, but you know, it is a tool. It's not an answer. It's, a, it's something to use. Um, and again, you know, I knew I wanted to do an Indiegogo for Kremlin Head Two last year when I didn't want to do the film. But I'm like, you know, no one knows. No one knows. I haven't been around. I, you know, I just kind of haven't been out there. So that was. The, doing a short film like The Cabin and touring it and going into festivals was kind of preparation into going into this Indiegogo thing. You know, I needed to, you know, get some exposure, you know, play some festivals, you know, with, and, you know, getting some awards, getting some attention. I mean, all that kind of builds up. You build up followers leading into the launch of a successful campaign. And, you know, I talked to other filmmakers and got advice from them. And, you know, they also, you know, all the ones that had, you know, good, successful campaigns, they did the same thing. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of the same thing. You just got to build up, build up a following, you know, get some interest out there, and then when you launch it, you know, and then of course, depend on your perks and things like that. So, I didn't get my full goal of what I was going for, but you know, we got over half, and I was thrilled with it. You know, mm-hmm. because my first two films were completely self-financed. You know, I drained my my savings doing it. And on the second point of your question about celebrities and stars, you know, using it. It, that kind of really gets under my skin, not because I think they're taking anything away from me, but it's like, you know, they're rich. They have their own funds. If you believe in your project that much and you can afford to finance it, then, you know, put your money where your mouth is. You know, sure. when you see someone like Spike Lee asking for a million dollars, that just, I'm just like, dude, you're, you have millions of dollars. You know, you can get a studio. You can get anybody to give you money to shoot a film. Why are you using Indiegogo when I'm just sitting here begging for 15 grand, you know? And if I had oh, I, it, I wouldn't be on Indiegogo. I would use my own mind. So, um, I agree just, with you 100% on that. 100%. Just, what, but that's, what, that's, you, that's what, my opinion. <laughs> no, I feel you. I'm Jason, what are your thoughts? Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I, I think it's a Brian told, too. I, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely not a guarantee or means to an end for everyone. Uh, you gotta, you got to really know how to use it. you got to know how to reach into, out into the bitter ends of your connections. Uh, you sort of have to have a pool of connections to begin with for it to be really useful. If you don't really know a lot of people, if you go on to Facebook with 50 followers on Facebook, you're not going to probably make a lot of money. you know. But if you have several thousand and your friends have several thousand and you sort of just keep throwing it out in the universe, then chances are it will come back, it'll come back to you. Um, and, you know, with the celebrities... Uh, you know, I, I'm not. I, I've made a couple projects on my own, out of my own pocket as well. Um, and you know, I say to each their own. Uh, hey, if they if they make money off it, great, good for them. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't hold any animosity towards them because the tools are there for anyone and everyone to use. And sure. I guess it's sort of smart because you know they know they can use their celebrity to bring in masses of people you know with the push of a button and so hey you know they they did what what they had the right to do and they made money doing it and you know good for them and hopefully their film project will be good you know it doesn't guarantee <laughs> that <laughs> so as we well all know, another thing that you guys had mentioned and this will kind of start going over into your guys other other works you know you had mentioned going on the festival circuit and winning awards and things like that kind of you know for the average fan who who has not gone to to a horror movie convention you know kind of explain what the experience is like going out there to meet the fans both on a personal and professional level and i always like to ask this one when you're at these events what's the weirdest thing you guys have ever been asked to autograph <laughs> That well, always gets good answers. I'm trying yeah. to tell you right I'm now. I'm sure Jason's got some good ones for that. I don't know if I do. <laughs> um, 
but uh, I'm embarrassed. No, Probably. this well, I had never done the film, the film festival circuit at all until I did the cabin, and we actually it seems like it's been a long time. It hasn't been the cabin just came out in August, so it's been like what six or seven months. So it's still kind of right. fresh, you know, film out there. We're playing, I think, three festivals this month actually. Um, but uh, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I submitted the films. I'm like, you know, back then I was just like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we got in a few? That was my thing. One or two, that'd be awesome. You know, I have a couple of laurels to put on our poster. And so the first festival we got into was in San Antonio, San Antonio Horrific Film Festival. And so I'm like, Jason, you want to get, you know, we got to go. This is our technical world premiere. And he was like, yeah. So we, you know, we went, I didn't know what to expect at all. It was like four or five days long. And um, but this was a street, you know, it was just a film festival. It wasn't a convention. Um, I think they had a couple celebrity guests there, but you know, it was, it was just films. <clears throat> so of course I'm, you know, green as hell going there. I've never done any of this, and there's a lot of guys there that have been there year after year. And some of these guys had like multiple projects in the festival, and I'm just looking at Jason, going, "Oh my God, we're not, we're not going to win anything. Are you kidding me? You know, look at all these people here that know all these people. No one knows us. And, and, act, and our film played last. It was the last film oh, yeah. of the whole festival. You know, no one talked to us the whole festival. You know, we were just bitter. Was, yeah, we were, <laughs> biting, we were biting our nails. You're like, what's so, going to happen? And so, you know, it came on, you know, the, the, the film showed, and and we just got, like, this really great response. And, like, the Q&A just kept going on and on. Finally, the guy stopped everybody, you know, because they had to do the awards. And... um. Jason was nominated for Best Actor. He got a nomination. Uh, my lead actress was nominated. So the awards are going along. And they go to, you know, read the nominations for Best Actor, and they just left Jason's name off. And I'm just like, really? <laughs> you know, this is sucks. I just want to leave before, this, before I get embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, and then my lead actress came. You know, they, her award comes. She doesn't win anything. And I was like, oh, God. And then the short film comes up, and we actually won. And I was just set there shocked, you know. Because no one talked to us, I didn't get any kind of vibe. So once we, you know, we got that first award, I think it was just like this large weight of it lifted off of us, and we were just kind of like ready. And like, okay, you, let's. And what backed it up is once we got outside of the theater, you know, out in the hallways, mingling with people, just the amount of compliments that people came up, and you know, and these these are genuine. Earnest compliments. You know, everyone yeah. was just very gracious and very kind. They surrounded Jay. Everybody surrounded Jason. You know? Oh, I don't know. Because no. you know, Jason's this really, this real quiet guy throughout the whole festival. They didn't even know he was an actor, and then they see him on the screen, and he's just this huge, creepy dude that flip freaks everybody out. And everybody's just like, all these filmmakers are coming up to him, like, oh my god, you were so awesome, you know. And, and that's another good you know, reason back what we were talking about earlier, like to do these small projects, and you don't know what you're going to get from it. And I, I think you've got a lot of exposure from it just oh, yeah. in this film, you know? And so that was, it just blew me away. That was my first experience. And from then, I think we've played 22 other festivals since then. And we've won like five, five best short. And I know Jason got his first award for best actor. My first best actor award ever. Yeah, this was so. he's been active forever, and he would talk, he told me in his last feature gut that everybody got nominated and got awards, but him, and so he finally gets <laughs> his first award, and it's for this short film. <laughs> I mean, what is it? I mean, from like I said, from a professional standpoint and a personal standpoint, though, you know, kind of explain how it feels to you know when your name is read off, you know, that you've won an award. I mean. You know, we you know we all we all three of us understand. You know, working on smaller films. You know, we know we're not we we know we're not making the big paychecks. We know we're not, you know, big A list celebrities. But you know, what is that? How does that make you feel? Do you feel vindicated? Do you feel more driven? You know, what does it do for you guys to win something like that? It um. I mean, the sensation I felt, and, and you know, when you, when you invest twenty three years of your life. You know, as Tommy has too. You know, I'll tell a story if we have time about how Tommy and I had actually probably crossed paths and we didn't even know it uh, <laughs> 20 years prior. Um, it, it, oh, yeah, it, that's a good yeah, story. Yeah, it was sort of like, not to sound cheesy, but I felt like it was I was at the Oscars. For me, you know, as an actor, <laughs> like that award meant as much to me as if I, I were at the Oscars because it just validates that, you know, 
all the time and effort that you put into the craft of doing something that's crazy. And if, and if it's horror films, uh, it's still you've reached out to an audience and you've sort of that's your goal. Your goal is to to for people to connect to you and and to get what you're doing and 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 hopefully like the work at the end of the day. Um, sure. Because I like what I'm doing and I, I do it in the hope that the audience likes what I'm doing. And so when you are rewarded for that, it just all comes full circle. You know, you feel like, yes, okay, good. Things things are as they should be. You know, it's all working in the right direction. Uh, not that I never thought it wasn't, but, you know, it, it's stepping stones. You know, you get that first film that gets in your into a, a first festival. And then the first festival your next film gets into several festivals and then your next film gets into dozens of festivals and then they win awards and then your friends that you know win awards <clears throat> and then one day you win an award and it just goes to show you that if you hang in there long enough I think I said that at my speech I said I hope no other <laughs> actor in this audience has to wait 23 years to win an award but sometimes you just got to hang in there you know if you wait long sure. enough it'll happen How about for you Tommy I mean what I mean how does well, it feel to Yeah well, for me, I mean, when when my film won any of the awards, I I wasn't, you know, I mean, I was happy, but it wasn't for me. I, I just every time I did, I'm like, you know, I'm like a parent. I'm just like, so I'm like, oh great, you know, everyone thought my actors were awesome, you know, because anytime I would hear if my if Jason or Morgan wasn't there, you know, of course I'm I'm the first one that calls and lets them know. But my my vindication is, you know, watching the film there with the audience, because making sure everybody jumps where they're supposed to, get scared where they're supposed. To, I mean, that's. That's it for me. The award itself is more like for for my cast because I see that as, you know, I'm excited for them because the film, you know, everyone liked the film. I just feel like, you know, it wasn't for a waste of time. And, and you know, as a filmmaker, you kind of go through this roller coaster process where you're all, you know, your film's great, you think it's wonderful, and then you you, you keep on, and then you're like, oh, does this, this stupid movie even make sense? Is it even good? And then, you know, it's kind of an up and down thing, and that these awards kind of help to help you with that, you know. Because, you know, here we are at the end of the festival. Our film was the last film to show. And I'm like, you know, this movie sucks. What am I doing? Why did I waste my money? And then it wins. And then you're back up again. And then it starts back over. You know, are we going to get into this festival or not? Are we going to get turned down? And what you said about the audience, too, is, is, is it's so funny because I've been to so many festivals where you sit. And, and I, I always had a fear of sitting in the back of the theater because I'd watch everyone's reactions in front of me. And you, you, you just can't read the audience's reactions in the dark. It's so misleading because the minute you see someone put their, you know, their arm up on their head and lean on it, you're going, oh gosh, oh they're so bored, they hate it, you know. <laughs> or if you see someone like jerk their head a certain way, you're like, you know, what, is, what does that mean? Uh, and so it's, it's, I, I got to the point where I just wanted to sit in the front row for every screen, <laughs> so I wouldn't <laughs> think about it. Um, so you can't judge from what the audience is doing until really afterwards. Um, and sometimes you can't, like Tommy said, you'll see them jump in the right places or, or whatever, or laugh on the on the laugh lines. Um, and I've gotten to the point where I'm pretty I'm pretty numb. You know, it doesn't affect me like it used to. Like I used to be a ball of nerves walking into watching myself in a screening, and now I really look forward to it. I've sort of grown to like sit in the audience and just accept whatever happens happens. If they hate it, they hate it. So be it. And if they love it, they love it. Great. Yeah, I mean, it works both ways. You know, we've we've been to festivals where they loved it. We've been to festivals where nobody could give a shit if we were there or not. So <laughs> we really, that makes us really appreciate our wins better. And, um, you know, Jason and I have been in a few, and Morgan, you know, where we were like, why did we even come here? But, you know, it just it depends <laughs> on the audience. There's a lot of politics involved in a lot of these festivals. But the ones, you know, that we've been to where we've won awards, it was just such good experiences, you know. So we're going to hopefully, you know, we hopefully we'll get into some. We you know with this feature too. You know, features are a little harder to get into because they're harder to program. But you sure. know, I've had a good experience, so I'm I'm looking forward to it. Now we're all pretty much in the same geographical location. I'm, you know, I'm in North Carolina and have done the majority of my work in state. Um, worked in Atlanta one time on something. You know, Tommy, you're you're right there in Columbia, South Carolina. Jason, mm-hmm. you've been all over the place, but you're primarily based out. You know, you do the majority of your work in the South as well, from from what Correct. I've been reading. Yep. You know, 
kind of you know what what is the film what's the film filming industry like down there in in South Carolina and you know how has how has local support been for what you're getting ready to do? Well, Jason's in Atlanta, right? Um, so there's tons of I mean everything is shot at I mean Atlanta booming. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah big. It's, it's huge. Um, in South Carolina, you know, you there's you either go, let's say, to Wilmington, you go to, to Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, there's some stuff that kind of goes on in Charleston. It's kind of spread out and sparse. Um, back when I used to work on a lot of stuff, you know, there's a lot of movie of the week type stuff. You know, there's Lifetime movies. Sure. I must have worked on a hundred of those, and they're all shot, it seems like, in Charlotte. But there's not a lot in for that reason alone, um, you know, there's not a lot of film film work. There's some. There's not a lot. There's definitely right. a lot of horror film work. And so um, going to a lot of these festivals and things we went to, I, um, I've i always wanted to have a film festival in South Carolina, you know, for horror filmmakers. And so because of that, because there's not a lot of work, because there's not a lot of horror, I, I kind of, you know, started with my partner, a festival in Charleston, and we're, you know, this year we're doing the very first horror festival. It's called Crimson Screen Horror Film Festival in April, and we're doing it the week after the Charleston International Film Festival. Kind of riding on their coattails, but also because um, they, even though they're in South Carolina, they spew off at their international festival, which is why they don't showcase a lot of quote-unquote South Carolina filmmakers, which I think is a crop. So our festival specifically showcases South Carolina filmmakers, and we really reached out to, you know, tell, you know, horror makers, professional, novice, students, whatever, if you're in South Carolina, please, you know, submit your films. And, of course, we've got other films from all over as well. But that was kind of one of the catalysts that got me wanting to, you know, create this festival in South Carolina. Now, Jason, you can finish that. I don't know how it is in Atlanta. I'm sure there's a lot more work, but go ahead. Yeah, I mean, Atlanta has a, a great community for the horror genre. I mean, <clears throat> there's a gazillion festivals that uh, take place here every year, especially in October. Uh, you got Dragon Con that showcases horror films. They have a section for that. I mean, it's, it's and, you know, we have The Walking Dead here, of course, which is yeah. crazy huge, you know. Um, so it, it's here. It's here. It's happening. Um, I'm just starting, you know, I'm, I've only been in Atlanta, I'm going on two years now, and I'm just starting to sort of meet all the independent filmmakers here and sort of get to know who they are. And it takes time. It's sort of one of those things where it, you have to meet them uh, one at a time, and then you sort of get passed around once once they get to know you and they know who who the guys are, the guys that want to work and do stuff. Um, you know, you start to get a reputation, and, and people, you know, start to find you out, which is great. And not just horror, but independent film in general. So, sure. Now, my fans that listen to the show want you know a lot of the questions that came in, Jason. A lot of people wanted to know more about your role in um, uh, Lincoln versus Abraham Lincoln versus zombies. <laughs> um, you know, and and what I wanted to ask you, you know, you play um, you play John Wilkes Booth in the film. Correct. Yep. And you know. You know, how did you prepare for that role? You know, what, did you do a lot of actual research into the role of, of John Wilkes Booth? You know, how much of it did you make on your own? You know, that that seemed to be the question that I got the most from from my listeners. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's funny. It's, it's the asylum, and if people don't know the asylum. They do all the the movies on Sci Fi Channel, like Crocosaurus versus Mega Shark and Sharknado. Oh yeah. Uh, so, and asylum, you know, sort of has that reputation for. Uh, get it done and get it done quick. And so I was cast, I think, two days before shooting. <laughs> so, um, so whatever preparation I pulled out, uh, I, I luckily, because of my theater background, I had done a lot of uh, work on John Barrymore, uh, the actor, Drew Barrymore's grandfather, and he was a, a silent screen actor and a stage actor um, who actually had seen uh, the Booth, both Booth brothers perform. Um, so I sort of, you know, from having played John Barrymore, I sort of pulled a lot of the essence of, of what I thought uh, John Booth would be from John Barrymore. You know, I sort of used a lot of the same uh, characterizations and 
and speech and mannerisms that I felt would have been very much the same, even when they're several decades apart. Um, but, you know, all great actors pull from the actors before them. Uh, I know that uh, Sir Lawrence Olivier pulled specific, specifically from John Barrymore's performance when he did Hamlet. And I'm sure John Barrymore pulled from the Booth brothers when he did his Hamlet. So, uh, so I don't feel, I felt sort of like if I had more time, there are definitely a lot of things I would have done differently, <laughs> mm-hmm. but um, but that's sort of where I got the essence of the character from. Um, okay. And 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 working with Richard Shankman, the director, you know, it's sort of a fine line between what I want and then what he wants, and then we sort of find a happy median. And that that's sort of how he came about. Okay. Now, Tommy, for you, uh, one of the things that I found interesting when I was uh, doing my research on you was uh, a lot of the stuff that I read about Generation X. And, you know, of course, you know, publications like Rue Morgue and Fangoria, you know, they all praised it, but the name that stood out to me was Joe Bob Briggs, and he gave the movie four stars. Now, you know, those of us that are horror fans and are a little bit older, you know, Joe Bob Briggs is a name that meant something to us because he was someone mm-hmm. we listened to. We respected his opinion. How did you feel when Joe Bob Briggs gave Generation X four stars? Yeah, I mean, that's it's kind of like what I was talking about earlier, you know. that That's kind of like, I don't know, that's like the top, you know, back before, again, there, there's no Internet, there's no Facebook. The only way to know about these films is, you know, you see the magazines, you see, you know, Joe Bob Briggs on TNT, you know. And so right. sending him my film, it was just kind of like, uh you know, he'll, maybe he'll see it, maybe he won't. I don't know. But, you know, once I saw it, I mean, I had to read it a few times. I was, because, you know, he's so funny and sarcastic, you know, in his reviews. I was, when I first read it, I couldn't tell if he, was, if he liked it or not, you know, because he's like, thank right. God for South Carolina. So, like, is he being sarcastic? But, no, it, it was awesome. <laughs> I mean, I, I put that on the box, you know, the, the VHS sleeve. I was all, you know, it was just it was awesome, and I talked to him a lot online, you know, after that. You know, we used to, he would send me messages all the time, and, you know, like, keep me updated on your projects. And so that was that was kind of like being in Fangoria for me. Those were two, like, really highs for me. Oh, so, for, for sure. Yeah. Um, now, Jason, uh, you had mentioned uh, a few moments ago, you had mentioned the rectory. What can you yes. tell us about the rectory and uh, – you know, when when can we expect a release date on that? Uh, I'm not 100% sure of the release date. Uh, I know that we're planning to shoot in October. Uh, the mm-hmm. Rectory is uh, a film, and the director uh, is a gentleman named Jonathan Chance. He's a English chap, uh, and he currently lives out in L.A., and he actually grew up near the Bortory uh, Rectory, which is what the film is based on, and it's one of the oldest Victorian mansions uh, haunted, I should say, oldest haunted Victorian mansion in England, I think in Essex, uh, the town of Essex. And um, very, very well known. Like, it's it's got a lot of history. And uh, and there's a gentleman named Harry Price, who's one of the earliest sort of paranormal uh, investigators that he, he was really the first, I think he was the first guy that sort of, he locked himself in the mansion, I think, for like a month and just investigated the hauntings and the things that went on there. Um, so he's a real guy. It's based on a lot of factual history with a little bit of what Jonathan Chance threw in there himself. Um, and it's produced by Calvin Vanderbeek. Uh, has the, uh, my fellow actor is uh, Crispian Belfridge. Uh, he's going to play Harry Price, and I play Henry Tennyson, which is sort of his assistant. So we're like, uh, you know, he's the Sherlock Holmes uh, and, and I'm I'm the uh, oh gosh, what's the Sherlock Holmes character that <laughs> Watson? What's that? Watson, exactly. Doctor Watson. Uh, yeah. There you go. So sorry, I kind of blanked on that. Uh, so <laughs> that's sort of the sort of what's the chemistry between our two characters, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm very much looking forward to it. I got I got two other films I just want to do a really quick. Oh, and, and sure, for please. more information on that, just go to uh, Twitter at Rectory Film. And uh, I'm also working on another film with Adam Albrand, which who you may know uh, or may not know. He directed Cross Bear in, in the Cemetery. Uh, he's doing a film called Hunters, 
and uh, he cast me in a, a little little bit part. I won't give away anything. And we're going to shoot that sometime this spring, summer. And I'm also working on another film called Into the Woods uh, with Jason Wasley. Uh, it's he, this gentleman who works on uh, the Ghost Adventures TV series. He, he's been on it for many, many years, um, which kind of ties into the Rectory in sort of a strange way. Uh, it's his first time, I think, directing his own feature uh uh, short film, sorry. Uh, great mm-hmm. script, really great script. I'm looking forward to doing it, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll bang that out this summer, uh, along with Crendel in the Head too. Yep, awesome. yep, yep. Well, guys, look, I, you know, I'm I'm hoping to be able to come down during filming uh, to do an on-set look, you know, do something for Horror Society. So hopefully that's something that we can work out. But in closing, before we go, you know, like I said, the film has a cult classic status you know there are people that love this film and and consider it one of their all-time favorites you know what are you guys looking to bring to the sequel that wasn't in the original and you know of course it's never too early to ask could we be looking at (laughs) crinoline head three you never know um (laughs) this i mean there's a lot of course you know i'm i'm a little older than i was when i did the first one so we're hoping to bring a little more creative writing. I'm definitely bringing a lot more gore and blood and guts and impalings and things like that and, and a lot more uh, offensive uh, characters, I guess I could say. Um, but no, it's still a lot of humor. There's a lot. I mean, it's still got the, you know, the first one was known for its kind of crude humor, a lot of John Waters-esque throwbacks, but it's going to be a little more dark, a little more polished than the first one, of course. But I mean, it's not going to be—it's not going to be something where you see the first one and the second one, and you're like, "How are these two men related?" So, I'm—I'm I'm really looking forward to to seeing people's reactions to uh, to some of the killings. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we let you guys go, um, do you have websites, Facebook, Twitter, anything? If, if fans want to follow you, follow the making of the film. Yeah, definitely. Um, for Kremlin Head Two, of course. Facebook.com slash Head 2 You can just do a search and you'll find it. And also, or you can, you know, my production company, Horse Creek Productions, that's on Facebook. The website, horsecreekproductions.net. We also have a, a Vimo page that's got Kremlin Head Generation X on it. If you want to stream it or download it, you can get copies on Amazon. You know, it's all out there. Just pretty much Google the title. You'll find it, everything related to it out there. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, Jason, for, go uh, ahead. Yeah, my uh, my website is jasonvale.com, so that's Vail, V-A-I-L, as in the ski resort in Colorado. Uh, and uh, you, my Twitter is jvale2, so you can hit me at that. And, uh, yeah, and you can pretty much find me on Facebook. I don't. I, I always accept anybody on Facebook, so I don't anybody. shun. I don't shun. <laughs> I'm well, on guys, Twitter, too, so you can, you can follow my plots as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That was good. You have to remember that. But one. you know, whatever. It's usually the same thing that's on Facebook, on Twitter. So pick, pick your, whichever one you like. Well, guys, I want to thank you for for being on. I had a great time. If you ever have any news or anything you need promoted, you know you can shoot me a line, and I'll get it up on Horror Society. And I hope to see you guys here in the next couple of months. I'll be down in South Carolina this weekend, Tommy. So. Maybe yep, if uh, yeah. your your schedule clears out, maybe we can meet up while I'm down there and we can do some more talking. But, uh, you know, you guys are always welcome on the show. Um, I've enjoyed your guys' work so far, and I'm looking forward to seeing more. Cool. Thank you, Michael. Great. Really appreciate it. Anytime, guys. Thank you for being on. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. And once again, we just had Tommy Faircloth. South Carolina director and actor Jason Vale discussing the upcoming filming of Crenoline Head 2, which will be shooting this spring down in South Carolina. Coming up, we're going to have our second part of our digital dismemberment Blu-ray review of Scream Factory's Eve of Destruction. But before that, we are going to go into the second song on our Metal Blade Spotlight for the evening. The name of the band is Mount Salem. The name of the album is Endless. And the song is Lucid.
was Mount Salem's new CD, Endless. The name of the song was Lucid. They are in our Metal Blade spotlight for the evening. Welcome back to the Calling Hours Horror Podcast. This is the dead man, Michael Jones, representing Horror Society Radio. A little bit of info about Mount Salem. The name of the album is Endless. The release date on the CD is March 4th of this year. Mount Salem hails from Chicago, Illinois, and are a four-piece psychedelic rock doom metal band. They started writing music together in the summer of 2012 and released their first EP, Endless, in the spring of 2013. The band puts a strong emphasis on tone and feeling in both their songs and live performances. Most of the band switched from their normal instruments and picked up new ones for this band, and the result was much more natural than they had hoped for. Uh, They take their influence from the classics like Black Sabbath and Pentagram, which, if you listen to it, you could could definitely hear the Sabbath, and I would agree with the Pentagram as well. Uh, They play loud, heavy rock and roll using all vintage gear. They throw their own twist of dark and mysterious doom into their music, and they invite the listener to step into their sinister realm. The imagery and the lyrics will take you on a ride in which you won't know whether to be scared or grab a sword and join the battle. Endless feels like it's trapped in the nightmarish headspace of a psychic medium on a bad trip. And that was a quote from Mr. Growl. Um, Mount Salem has toured in the Midwest, South, and East Coasts, sharing the stage with bands such as Windhand, Weed Eater, Bone Gripper, Lopan, Mothership, and Howl. Mount Salem has fit on a wide variety of heavy shows and brings a live act to counter their music. Uh, Metal Blade signed them in the summer of 2013, and uh, they are currently touring and writing a new follow-up for a full-length album. Mount Salem is Emily Copland on vocal and organ, Cody Davidson on drums, Mark Hewitt on bass, and Kyle Morrison at guitars. If you like what you've heard, you can go check out Mount Salem on Facebook. And if you like the album, you can always head over to MetalBlade.com and pick it up from there. You can also get it on iTunes, or you could go to your favorite local retailer and demand your copy. So it is that time to do our second DVD review for the evening. So let's get to it. Digital Dismemberment And our choice for our Screen Factory Blu-ray review this evening will be Gregory Hines in E of Destruction This is a film I enjoyed from its earlier days uh, I remember seeing this when it first came out, uh, not necessarily in theaters, but I do remember seeing the film. Uh, for those of you that don't know the premise, uh, she's beautiful, indestructible, and unstoppable. Created in the image of her inventor, Eve 8, a sophisticated and deadly android, with a flawless combination of years of research, or is she? When an unexpected mishap during testing sends her to a sudden irreversible rampage, Eve begins stalking and killing anything she perceives as a threat. And now it's up to terrorism expert Jim Quay to find and deactivate her before she realizes her ultimate capability nuclear annihilation. You know, a fun movie that I remember from my childhood, you know. Released uh, in 91, I was uh, about 15 years old when this came out, and, you know, I enjoyed the film. Now, as far as a Screen Factory release goes, this is the transfer uh, straight from MGM. It has been cleaned up. It is a 1080p high-definition widescreen transfer. It does have ETS, HD, Master Audio Stereo. And, you know, it's, it's just one of those fun movies, you know. Nuclear war has always been a threat in in our times, as long as I can remember. And this film certainly plays on that element. You know, seeing, seeing Gregory Hines as, as uh, kind of the badass detective anti-terrorism guy was a little strange. I'm used to seeing him dancing a little bit more, you know, the history of 
the World Part One immediately comes to mind. But I think he plays the role with a certain panache, and he brings a depth to the character that we otherwise don't see. I always have a hard time pronouncing the actor's last name. Rene Stupja, uh, I believe is how you would say it. Um, is, is great in the dual role of both Eve Aid and of the doctor that created her. You know, and she pretty much is, you know, an unstoppable killing machine, especially once she goes nuclear. You know, she starts, she thwarts a, a, a bank robbery, um, winds up getting shot in the process. Um, you know, and goes on a rampage with machine guns and handguns and bare hands. You know, just all kinds of madness that goes on with her running around. And, you know, Gregory Hines' character trying to stop her before she basically nuclearly annihilates you know, the 20 city block. It's been catastrophic. Um, you know, there's there's your decent amount of, of, of gore and sexuality in the film. I mean, nothing that's so over the top that, that you would be embarrassed to watch the movie with your parents. Nothing like that. Um, you know, as, uh, as far as special releases go on the disc, uh, we did get the DVD trailer. Um, this is one of Scream Factory's more budget-lined DVDs. So, on this one, we do not get the behind-the-scenes interviews, uh, interviews, photos, or anything like that. Um, and while I think it was a movie of, of relative fun and has some following, I don't feel like it was a film that, that probably would have garnered that much behind-the-scenes and things like that. Overall, uh, as, as a film collector, and a film that I enjoyed from that time period, I would certainly recommend it, but if you're going into the film looking to get a plethora of extra features and special bonuses, this is certainly not going to be the disc for you. So, what I would rec- what I really would recommend is picking it up. Um, it's definitely a step up from the previous DVD release, so I wouldn't get it. You can head on over to ScreenFactory.com, pick it up there. Uh, you should be able to download it online, or you can get it from your favorite local retailer. As far as the rating goes, um, uh, the overall disc presentation, I do enjoy the alternative cover art on the front, which is, all, which is always a nice tool when it comes to buying a Screen Factory release. Um, again, you know, with no audio commentary or any other special features with any note, um, you know, if, if you're a big time collector, this is probably not an addition you can go after. But again, I think Screen Factory did a good job with the transfer. Um, like I said, it looks really good, it sounds really good, and it will look good on your shelf. Um, the overall rating for the disc, I would give it um, a six. The movie, I would give it a Again, that is by no means saying there's a quality issue. It's um, not just the is hog and the flow of the But other than that, an excellent performance and a great presentation at the same time. So, this evening, I think we've had a really wonderful show. Uh, we told everyone who the winners were in the 2014 Horror Society Awards. Congratulations to all those that won and all those that were nominated and voted. We couldn't have done it without you. Again, thank you to Mike D. and Mitchell Wells over at Horror Society for making all of that happen. Uh, And our DVD reviews, of course, uh, our first review, we had uh, Dracula, Prince of Darkness from Millennium Entertainment. I want to say thank you to Heather Wixon for sending that along for us for review. Our Scream Factory Blu-ray Spotlight was on Gregory Hines uh, in Eve of Destruction. want to say thank you to our friend Tom Chen at its Scream Factory for that. In our Metal Blade Spotlight tonight, we had Mount Salem, and we want to say thank you to our friend Kelly out at Metal Blade for sending all that along. We also had a really nice long interview segment 
with South Carolina filmmaker Tommy Fairchild and one of his or Faircloth, I'm sorry, Tommy Faircloth and actor Jason Vale coming on to talk about Crinoline Head 2, which is going to start filming in South Carolina in the next couple of months. So hopefully I will be down there to do an on-set report. So I'm looking forward to that. So I want to say thank you to the listeners. And before we leave, we are going to play the last song in our Metal Blade Spotlight this evening. The band closing us out will be Sag. The name of the CD is Delusions of Grandeur, and the name of the song is Then Wakens the Beast. And until next week, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Dead Man letting you know to all, rest in peace.
Lord, yes.